I'm sure was not a straight up journey because no entrepreneurial journey is straight up. Uh, but what's up for you? It was straight up for a while until yeah. about 2008, <laughs> but at an angle. Yeah. So to kind of give you the long and short of it is it's, I, I think it's a pretty interesting story from my own experience. So you know, I'm, you mentioned I'm in Blacksburg, near Virginia Tech. The story kind of starts here many years ago. My wife and I attended school here back in the 80s, the late 80s, and, and I was studying engineering. And, you know, the reason I studied engineering was because I was good in math and science. I liked it. My father was an engineer, uh, but I always wanted to be rich, to be honest with you. I mean, we lived in a nice middle class household growing up. And we weren't lacking anything, but I always wanted sort of more, you know, I had the Porsche picture on the oh, big yeah. poster on the wall and <laughs> all that growing up. And, and so I, you know, studied engineering, went out and started working and realized pretty quickly that it wasn't. Welcome to the Renegade Lawyer Podcast, the show where we ask the questions, why aren't more lawyers living flourishing lives and inspiring others? And can you really get wealthy while doing only the work you love with people you like? Many lawyers are. Get ready to hear from your host, Ben Glass, the founder of the law firm Ben Glass Law in Fairfax, Virginia, and Great Legal Marketing, an organization that helps good people succeed by coaching, inspiring, and supporting law firm owners. Join us for today's conversation. Hey, everybody, this is Ben. Welcome back to the Renegade Lawyer podcast, where each episode I get to interview people inside and outside the legal profession who are making a ding in the world. Today, we're going outside of legal to Paul Neal. Um, and we're going to talk about owning and renting your building and all that sort of cool stuff. Paul is a serial entrepreneur um, operating his business, which is in Chesapeake, Virginia, but operating it out of the mountains of Blacksburg, Virginia, which if you've been in the Virginia Tech area is beautiful. And yes, for those of you who are listeners, this is my first live interview in two months. Most people know that I had uh, triple bypass surgery two months ago. And I, and if you haven't heard the story, I just this will scare the heck out of you because 66 years old, doing CrossFit, refereeing soccer games, I had zero symptoms. Repeat, zero symptoms. I started with a new doctor. He suggested a cardiac calcium score CT. That is a very simple test, not covered by insurance, costs about 130 bucks. That, let, that showed that I had possibility of heart disease. Test after test. Turns out I had five blockages. Uh, three of them were, were big enough, uh, were, were worthy of um, bypassing. And now we're back. So I am a PSA for the coronary artery calcium screening <laughs> test. <laughs> but I am so happy to be back. I'm happy to be uh, alive, of course, back with my friends. And so Today, we're going to talk to Paul Neal. Paul is the owner of Vantage Point Commercial Capital. It is located here in Virginia, but he's a serial entrepreneur. He's the author of a book called Unleash Your Business. And Paul's niche, his expertise, his energy in the world is really helping business owners understand the asset of owning your own building, working out of your own building, what that can do for you, how to do it. And as I was telling Paul before we went live, this question comes up all the time in our lawyer mastermind groups because the lawyers are good at the lawyering. We're learning business skills. Not many of us know a lot about real estate. It's kind of scary to us, to a lot of people, Paul, I think just because it's not a transaction that they engage in frequently, right? They buy a house and they buy a bigger house yeah. and a bigger house, and they may own a building or two over time, Most, but most of them don't. And so they don't even know the space. So I was glad when you reached out and said, hey, I've probably got something that would be good for your group. And so welcome uh, this afternoon to our podcast, our little Renegade Lawyer podcast, sir. Yeah, Ben, I'm super excited to be here. And I'm already floored by your story because I consider myself very athletic and, you know, try to take care of my health and all that too. But you're the second person <laughs> I've heard. One was a neighbor that had sort of these invisible symptoms that didn't exist and were really sort of on the precipice of, of potentially a major catastrophic health issue. And so I'll just double down and say, I'm going to get the test myself. I, so I, I appreciate that. a lot of the test <laughs> in the last few months. Yeah. By documenting this story and I'm documenting the recovery and, you know, through Facebook and TikTok and stuff like that. But anyway, 
I love when we love talking to entrepreneurs, getting outside of our own world of legal. Tell us a little bit, Paul, about your story. Like, how did you get to where you are today? What's that journey been? I'm sure it was not a straight up journey because no entrepreneurial journey is straight up. Uh, but what's up for you? It was straight up for a while until yeah. about 2008, but at an angle. Yeah. So to kind of give you the long and short of it is it's, I, I think it's a pretty interesting story from my own experience. So, you know, I'm, you mentioned I'm in Blacksburg near Virginia Tech. The story kind of starts here many years ago. My wife and I attended school here back in the eighties, the late eighties. And, and I was studying engineering and, you know, the reason I studied engineering was because I was good in math and science. I liked it. My father was an engineer. Uh, but I always wanted to be rich, to be honest with you. I mean, we lived in a nice middle-class household growing up and we weren't lacking anything, but I always wanted sort of more, you know, I had the Porsche picture on the big yeah. poster on the wall and <laughs> all that growing up. And, and so I, you know, studied engineering, went out and started working and realized pretty quickly that it wasn't, you know, my image of it and the reality I was living were really disconnected. You know, I had bigger dreams than I thought I was going to have sort of working that nine to five. And it really was culminated. I was in a, I was in a meeting once just kind of getting started and it was a small conference room and there were six or seven people in the room. And we used to design these custom network boxes that would test networks. Like just prior to the internet, it was coming on and these were like 70, $80,000 boxes, right? They were custom and we'd make them for HP and different companies. And they, and I was just kind of sitting there having a surreal experience because the, the other people in the room were arguing for, it must've been three hours about the color of the little rubber booties that went on this $80,000 box. And I'm like, does it even matter? What's the point? You know, and I'm sucking in all this, you know, fluorescent light. And I'm like, this is, is gotta be better than this. And so anyway, long story short, my search for, for freedom was sort of accelerated at that point. Ended up going into business with my sister and brother-in-law in a marketing company. It was another story, but I worked with them for about 10 years and, and got into engineering and did pretty well financially. But during that process, I had a really good friend that was in the real estate finance industry. And, you know, again, I, I always liked math and science. And I was like, hey, you know, that's pretty intriguing, this whole idea of finance. And he was doing really well. And he had started his own business and I thought, well, maybe if I went to work in that space, I had some time based upon the business we had developed. It was generating a pretty good income. It wasn't really requiring all my time. And so I dabbled in there and ended up going head over heels and started in real estate finance initially in the residential area. So I learned, got my teeth cut in the late nineties in that and really started developing a clientele of business owners and entrepreneurs and professionals. And what I was fascinated with was, was the commercial side, quite honestly, and in, in funding the businesses and acquisitions in real estate. And so I've had some other businesses in there, uh, a title company I had when 2008 came along, I, my business was positioned to sell and the world didn't cooperate <laughs> the global financial crisis. So I took a sideways pivot and, uh, had, a, it was a startup with a partner in the tech space. And we built that for actually about 10 years and sold it. And in the last four or five years of there, I had enough freedom to go ahead and start spinning up and getting back into commercial. And so that's been my focus for the last four or five years is writing commercial We sold that other company. And really focusing in on helping business owners and entrepreneurs um, consider, you know, whether buying the space that they run their business in makes sense. If it, is it a good opportunity or isn't it? And really a lot of education, because I found there's a lot of ignorance out there about it, right? Because it's not something that you do on a regular basis. Well, here's what I hear you say, is you're good and you have this high school in the niche of commercial lending and acquisition of space and all that. But underneath all of that is a love for the entrepreneur, like helping yeah. whatever type of business it is. And, you know, mom and pa, I often say like a great legal marketing, we're helping mom and pa grow great law firms and you're helping them like achieve their dreams while still doing what they are good at in the world, whatever that is, technology, marketing companies, professional services companies, and so that's, and I love talking to people like you because, uh, you know, entrepreneurs drive the world. Like we, I truly believe that like no, nothing good happens until you have the freedom, particularly here in America to take an idea, put it into the marketplace, 
risk criticism, but also accept the, you know, the wins when they come. And then surrounding yourself with folks who are good at tax and real estate and, you know, get your marketing experts and things like that. So, so I think, so that's cool. Like a kindred soul there. So yeah. when, t- tell me how these conversations start. In other words, to the entrepreneur, the business editor come to you saying, like, I heard this idea. I saw something on a podcast. I read a book. Now I can think it'd be a good idea to buy a, the building that I'm, that I'm going to build my business in. Mm-hmm. Or is there some other way that this idea is generated where now you can come in and explain, here's how it's done? Yeah, I mean... Um... You know, the conversation starts and, you know, different, there are different triggers in the process, you know, generally speaking, you know, businesses have life cycles and stages, right? And in the early stages of a business, you know, you're spinning that business up. And so most of us are heads down doing the day to day, right? We're working in the business, trying to get it profitable, trying to figure out how to get a client or a customer exactly. and to get them to come back, right? And to get some stable business. And then we're looking to figure out how we can delegate and build a team. And so we can build a business versus being basically trading hours for dollars. So in those early stages, most business owners and entrepreneurs aren't thinking about you know the space. Plus they don't know necessarily what their space requirements are going to be, you know, are they in the right location? Right. You know, you're just kind of, is it going to be, yeah. If I buy something, is it going to be big enough five years from now? Or do I even like, still like the geographic area? Those are, yeah, they run through their heads for sure. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it's somewhere generally in the, you know, four to five to six year range where someone's, or they've got some stability. They've got some of these questions answered, They've got some predictable cash flow and they've got sort of a, a runway ahead in the future. So they kind of, they know they're going to be around for a while. So it's a more of a, not just an entrepreneurial idea, but a proven concept, right? And, you know, a lot of times it happens around lease renewal time. So they, you know, they sign these leases and they're three years or five year leases. And, you know, now it's time to re-up that thing. And the terms might have changed at that point. And so it's a, you know, it's a reflection or an inflection point. It could be that they're sort of bursting out at the seams from a personnel standpoint and they need more space. And they're like, okay, I've done this lease thing. It worked out, but now do I really want to go lease a larger space? And they see the amount of money, you know, what, what my monthly, you know, nuts going to be just to lease the space. And so those are triggers. And then once in a while, some of those, I won't say smarter ones, but maybe more fortunate ones will see somebody or know somebody selling a business or retiring and they have some real estate and they bought real estate. And so they've got this great asset. They're like, wow, I'd like to be able to do that too. So, you know, a recurrent issue we see is with, you know, business owners, professionals that as as they achieve more success and they get more income, they're spinning off income and they might upscale their personal residence. But so many of us upscale our lifestyle, right? To match that income. And so we're really not getting that much further ahead where, you know, they're like, well, how can I reinvest a lot of this money? And honestly, Ben, a lot of the conversations come because people will talk to us about buying investment real estate, business (laughs) owners, right? They want to buy a multifamily or a duplex or whatever. We're like, okay, that's fine. But let's talk about what, you know, what are you doing with your current business? You're literally walking on an investment, you know, Do, have you considered owning yeah, that? They've, li- they've listened so, to all those podcasts yeah. and visited all of those websites. Um, and everybody wants to have <clears throat> a Airbnb portfolio. <laughs> yeah, they do. And, you know, they're, you know, signing up to plunge toilets and, and all that. And, and, you know, obviously there are ways around that and we're advocates of that, but, you know, ironically, when you're buying investment real estate, pure investment real estate, like Airbnbs and all these other things, you're going to need, you know, 20, 25, 30% down payment. What most people don't realize is if it's, if you're buying the space that your business operates out of 51% in most cases, you can get into that space for zero to 10% down. Um, and, And so it's, a lot of times it's a lot less capital out of your pocket to get into that space versus going out and buying all these so other So I think a lot of properties. people don't realize that. And honestly, yeah. because again, we don't engage in these transactions frequently, we don't even know 
to who to go to talk to, and then who do you trust? And so t- let's talk about, because I want to talk about sort of the finance side, things yeah. that a, a prospective buyer should be thinking about, or maybe want to think about. And then I want to talk about like finding the deal, finding the building, or the space that you want to buy. So we're recording this. It's uh, May. It's May of 2024, in case someone listens to it later. Show me sort of the world of finance as it is today. You know, headlines are about rising interest rates and things like that. What does it really feel like for someone on the ground like you are helping entrepreneurs buy the place they're going to work out of, I guess? Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, a wide, a wide open question. There's a lot of areas we can go to, but yes, there's been a lot of PR and it's legitimate that interest rates have gone up. You know, the Fed has, you know, went on this curve of increasing their prime rate over the last couple of years pretty significantly. They're pretty much done that. They've signaled that. They actually came out yesterday and said, yeah, we're not going to raise rates anymore. The, you know, all the money is worth the top end and their the next moves will be to start to cut. So I think the pain of that has kind of gone by the wayside, but to to sort of understand like the financing piece, interest rates certainly impact the decision. There are ways to mitigate that with different loan programs. There are ways to mitigate that with different structures. Like for instance, we have an entrepreneur, he is a high-end residential home improvement company. And he, we just helped him build a flex warehouse space, which is in really high demand, flex warehouse, um, 12,000 square feet. And he's going to occupy about, I think, 6,000, no, about seven or 8,000. Yeah, he's got 4,000. He's leasing out to two other companies. And so he's generating revenue from those two tenants that are offsetting his mortgage payment and actually almost making the entire mortgage payment. And that's in this rate environment right now. So if you look at that interest rate, it's, I mean, in the context, it's yeah. significantly less than the current rates. But that being said, there, there's basically five ways to, to finance owner-occupied commercial real estate. One is cash, which is pretty easy. We don't really recommend it, but it's you can do it. You can get a seller to finance it. Sometimes sellers will do that. Some are part of it. You can go conventional financing, You know, walk into your local bank who... Their claim to fame is they love to help small businesses, but the reality is that's more of a marketing pitch than reality. Expect to pay 20 to 30% down payment when you walk into the bank and shorter loan terms and loan covenants and things like that, that you might not be happy about. And then SBA, Small Business Administration has two programs that can fit based upon scenarios. One is the 504 and one is the 7A. And they're both can be really good for uh, first time owner occupied uh, real estate purchases. They both have their pluses and minuses interest rates today, even in this environment. And as we're speaking, the prime interest rates, eight and a half percent to buy an owner occupied commercial space, you're going to be in the six and a half to seven and a half percent range, all the way up to 11% based upon which program you go with. Hey guys, this is Ben. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast, Not just the marketing and practice building strategies, but the philosophy of the art of living your best life parts. You should know that my son Brian and I have built a tribe of like-minded lawyers who are living lives of their own design and creating tremendous value for the world within the structure of a law practice. We invite you to join us at the only membership organization for entrepreneurial lawyers that is run by two full-time practicing attorneys. Check us out at greatlegalmarketing.com. And so you're, in, again, just talking about the finance, your role is what? Somebody listens to this podcast, you even gets your book, says, this is perfect yeah. for my next stage of my entrepreneurial journey. Your advisor, t- tell us, like, what's your coaching role and professional services role for someone who's in this space? Yeah. So our, our role is I think we're unique in the marketplace. We may not be the only company that does this, but our focus is education. And so we work with clients and we like to work with people well in advance of this decision that I'm going to buy a property, right? You know, it's not like buying a personal residence where your wife says, hey, honey, I think I wanted some extra space or I want a view of the the water or whatever. 
and 30 days later, you can be in contract and the house can close, right? Commercial is much more evolved because there's a lot of considerations, you know, the space, what are your space needs going to be? What do the finances look like? How is it going to impact my customer, my client, my patients, or, you know, whatever that look, the location. So there's a lot of it, a lot of factors, how much time is left on the lease, you know, let, will my lease soar go month to month for me for a while if I need to. So we like to say 12 to 24 months in advance, if you're thinking about it, that we should have a conversation. And our whole mission, Ben, is to do a deep dive with someone and understand their current business, where they expect to go, what are their goals, what are their concerns, and then dig deep into potential issues that they may have. We have a process that uncovers what I call the skeletons, brings the skeletons out of the closet, because the reality is, what most people don't realize is that in, in today's lending environment, whether it's residential or commercial, any skeletons that you have will come out of the closet, but you just don't want them coming out of the closet, you know, at the end of the process. <laughs> That's right. So in commercial, we want to know early and upfront, and most of the time we can mitigate or deal with it and, and work with it. And if we know up front, then we can we can resolve it or at least your position, you know paint the proper picture to get the approval that you need for the loan. It's when surprises show up. And, and what I always tell people is you don't want to rush in to a decision. Like I'll get a call once in a while from, from a client or a realtor. A lot of times it's a residential realtor, which are, they're wonderful people, but they don't understand the commercial space. And so they've had a client and helped them buy a few homes. And then now they want to buy this space. And so they've engaged in a contract and this contract is completely unrealistic they may have engaged with a commercial realtor who knew they didn't know what they were doing. And so let's just say it wasn't the best contract for the buyer. And so our role is to go deep, understand your situation, educate, and then basically completely underwrite and say, okay, Ben, based on your situation, what you're trying to do, here's the three or four options that, that are available into the market for you right now. We are, are, are sort of a, you could figure us as a, a funding concierge. Generally speaking, we don't use our own money. We work with local banks, national banks, non-bank lenders. We work with insurance companies. There's a ton of sources of, of capital out there that we work with. And, and our goal is to present the best options to you to make an intelligent decision. Like for instance, you know, okay, here's a 7A program. And if you choose this option with this down payment, then you need more collateral, which means the SBA is gonna wanna put a lien on your house. Now, your wife might not like that or your husband might not like that, right? So here's another option with a 504 where they're not going to require a lien on your house. Or if you want to put some additional money down, here's another option. Here's the interest rates and here's, and we can do an analysis and show the cost of the different loans over time. So over five years, 10 years, 20 years versus renting the different loan programs and whatnot. So we're all about education. And the other thing we're about is saying and identifying early and upfront and say, yeah, I don't think this is a good, op I don't think this is a good idea for you. You know, and here's why, and here's some things you need to work on, you know, between now and, you know, whatever, if your lease is coming due in 12 months, 24 months to revisit this conversation. So it doesn't do us any good to work with someone who is not in a good position to buy. We want to work with ones that are and educate them and then help them make a great decision. So once they make a decision, you know, we pre underwrite. if they decide they want to move forward, they can then go to whomever they want to work with and go directly to the local bank, or we'd be happy to represent them to find funding. And then we represent them to the lender, the investor. We're, you know, almost like an attorney, we're of counsel in between the two. And, and it's helpful because we can interpret what's going on with the questions the lenders and investors are asking versus the client situation, communicate both in, an, in, in, an, in a way that makes sense and is most helpful. Plus, the business owner, the entrepreneur can stay focused in their lane and whether it's in law or it's in, you know, building widgets or, you know, a veterinarian where they can stay there and not have to worry about, you know, all the things that are going on and wondering what like surprises are going to come up downstream. It would be we'll overwhelming to, to go into that process without an expert. And it's interesting because as you are discussing this, there's a lot of parallels to our practice. So if our personal injury clients were like, I can deal with that you had three prior accidents. If I know about you had three prior accidents and I can give you great advice, but if I hear about it for the first time at trial, we're in trouble. Uh, and then in our, you know, in our disability space, like our favorite client that comes to us is someone who says, I'm still working. I'm thinking, I, and I, I'm a, a doctor. 
and I've got to practice and I've got partners, but I've got a hand tremor and I'm thinking I may need to not be able to practice. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm coming to you months in advance of any decision so that we can figure out if it's the right choice. Again, same language you just used, figure out how to yeah. deal with any issues, understand the different insurance policies involved and set the claim and set the claim claim up ethically appropriately, of course, but so they don't step in it. And do you, and so you're spending, it seems like a significant amount of time and you probably have, I imagine resources for the potential, your next potential client, in addition to one-on-one -on -one talking, but you get compensated at the end of the, the deal if it goes through and, or are you get, are you getting compensated for any of this? You're doing entrepreneurial consulting, yeah. my friend. You're doing yeah. life, life consulting, yeah. <laughs> you know, one yeah. or two years in yeah. advance, 24 yeah. months ahead of time. Yeah. So it's both. So generally speaking, when someone will do an initial sort of a deep dive conversation, we have about six key areas that we check off to see if you potentially could qualify, if it makes sense. And if you pass all those filters and you want to go deeper and get the full underwrite and get, you know, and not just a full underwrite, but a relationship with us. So we're available to answer questions and all this in the interim during the process, we charge a small fee for that. It's not a lot, like $3,000 for that engagement. Yeah. And then you're, yeah. And then you're buyer ready. And that way we can justify putting our resources there. The other thing is we found that our clients take it a little more seriously when they're, they're paying a little bit for it. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just like, and here's the thing. If you can't invest $3,000, you probably shouldn't buy a million dollar building. It's probably not a good idea. I would say just rent. And then if we do engage in an actual transaction, most of the time our investors pay us directly. So it doesn't even cost the client anything. There are some occasions where there's a direct fee involved, but that's way in advance. And you know, up front, that would be one of the choices that you'd make, you know, based upon a particular scenario. But yeah, so that's how it works. And most people are fine with that. They understand, you know, they're business owners, investors or entrepreneurs, and they've got time. And, and that way we, we're under no pressure. So we don't feel like we have to do a deal with you. Our goal is to go deep, educate. Pro, that's where we provide our real value and say, here's the market, here are options. And the cool thing that we have, because we deal with so many clients and we have so many investors is where most business owners are very myopic. They might have a relationship with their local banker, you know, cause they've got a depository relationship there. They've had that for years and that's what all the bank wants Deposits anyway, is your deposit. Inertia. They don't want to do equals, much. I remain a bank, a yeah. client of a particular bank. That's all. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Inertia. Yeah. Since we've moved, I need to set up a local bank account. I just think about the pain I have to do just to move my personal accounts, not to mention business. But the bank wants your, that's what they all, all want is your deposit. So they can loan it back out in a fractional manner. And all They do not really want to loan you, you know, a million dollars or $2 million. They will. But again, the terms you might not be happy with, particularly the fine print. But what we have is we, has, we have a view, a landscape of a national landscape. And so there are some national lenders and the appetites change with the different lenders as the market changes, as you just mentioned a little while ago, I mean, the current environment, it's been quite the dynamic and volatile, you know, financial market over the last couple of years. And so you have one bank that's coming in saying, I want to do this or one investor and another one that's saying, oh, not today, not this week, you know, and it's a moving target. And so that's our job too, to know that, to say, okay, you know, here are the options for you where you would fit in the box. And so we find that we, that's how we feel like we can add value if someone chooses you know, that they want to work with us to actually place the loan. Let me ask you this comes. because so the amateur, like me, I'm pointing to myself, the amateur, you read the headlines and you read about the commercial landscape being weak. I, I took the, I went into Washington yeah. DC, which is, you know, right around the corner from where we are. And you, repeatedly you see and hear people aren't coming and the commercial real estate market is weak. Does that, Generally speaking, and I know every geographic location is going to be different, but generally speaking, has that inured to the benefit of entrepreneurs who are looking for their first space? Is there truly an opportunity? Let's just take maybe Virginia writ large. Again, lots of different cities and towns yeah. in Virginia. I get it. But it's, is right. in 2024, is there opportunity? 
that maybe doesn't exist pre-COVID? So it's really an interesting question, you know, and you talk about real estate is local. It's different everywhere. And even within real estate, you know, you have all these different asset classes. So when you hear the talk, like the mainstream media, you know, they're really pushing, you know, the office conundrum, right? Since COVID, nobody wants to go into the office, right? And so you see these large, you know, class A buildings are, you know, 50% occupied. So it, th there is a trend for employees to bring their employees back in. I think a lot of them have learned that productivity has dropped significantly, Jeez, which is a whole other conversation, right? When you walk, when you drive down the street, you know, in the middle of the day and everyone's out, you know, mowing you their lawns and all that, you, playing you the, got a top <laughs> golf in the middle of the morning and they're all yeah. working. <laughs> yeah. 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 Working. That's right. So the most of our clients, Ben, are, you know, the smaller businesses that have a need for, that have always had a need for employees to come in or patients or clients or whatever. And so they're generally not going to be in these big class A buildings. And, and so it doesn't really affect ours. Most of ours, when I think small businesses, they're in a small retail space or an office condo, True. or they got a flex space, or they built a building for the vet practice and all that. And that stuff's in super high demand. And no matter where you go, it seems like, you know, I don't do a lot in New York and California, but everywhere else, it seems like it's in great demand because people still, you know, yeah, we had the Amazon wave and everything's delivered to you, but you know, you're still going to take your dog in when he gets yep. sick, you know, you still have to go see your CPA face to face and find out how big the check you got to write, you know, is going to be, you know, and then like a lot of these home service companies, your contractors, your HVAC companies, your plumbers. Oh my gosh, the plumber. When we, when he came to our house, I, I was floored to fix a little plumbing, how much, you know, I, I started to realize I'm in the you wrong business. <laughs> <get> it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's like I get visions of, you know, this leak into the wall and then, you know, disaster. But those businesses are, they're thriving and they will, I think they will continue to thrive. And so I don't know, I can't say, well, there's a golden opportunity to come in here and buy okay, this stuff at a sure. discount. I'm not seeing that. If there's a, if there's a, if there's an opportunity, it would be for those that buy when the interest rates are at sort of the peak of the market and they're starting to turn you know, 12, 24, 36, 48 months from now, when they've come down some, I don't expect them to come down, but so much, there'll probably be even more demand on the property, which drives price up, you know? So I think the opportunity is more of an opportunity cost, right? And when you look in the long run, so if buying makes sense, if the, if the financial numbers make sense today, then Here's the thing, like my friend Kathy was an OBGYN, still is. Her husband sort of kicked her in the rear to buy her building 12, 13 years ago. Well, she's paid the building off, built a local practice. Patients came, you know, even during COVID, they had, because people get sick and they have babies, they got to come, right? So she had that. Well, one of these medical groups came in and was buying up practices. She saw a golden opportunity, sold the practice, got a nice fat paycheck, and said, hey, I still want to work another three or four years, but on my terms, they're like, this is great. You can stay there. You can run the place. And oh, by the way, I own the building. So they're like, no problem. We don't want to move the practice because all the patients are there, all the employees are, we'll just pay you rent to the tune of five, five figures every single month on your building coming in. And so the moral of the story is 12 years, 13 years later, if she was renting the space, regardless of the acquisition cost, regardless of the interest rate at the time, regardless of any of that, 12, 13 years would have passed and she either would have had this asset that's now throwing off, you know, six figures in income annually, or she wouldn't. And so you got to weigh that into your overall financial plan and, you know, what's the goal. And, you know, the thing about real estate is we both know that it goes like this in the short run. Absolutely. But generally speaking on the long run, five, 10, 15, 20 years out, and I don't recommend buying a space if you're going to be, you have a shorter time frame than five years on your business. Generally, it's going to go up and there's some tremendous advantage there. You got the tax advantages, the equity, and it becomes a forced, it almost becomes a forced savings plan for a lot of high income earning professionals and entrepreneurs because 
they're forced to put money in the bricks and mortar every single month where they might go buy a boat, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or a fancy car that, you know, you lose 50% of the value and you drive it off the lot or whatever. And all that stuff's great, but you know, why miss the opportunity? Let me, let me switch gears sort of entirely because I want to poke your entrepreneurial brain a little bit because it sounds like you're very smart about marketing and positioning yourself and creating a unique message and and deliver and showing up differently, I think is what we would call that. Talk to us a little bit about Vantage Point Commercial Capital. How many people under roof do you have? I'm curious about your your vision for that. Like like because you're having owners come to you and pour out their soul and their mm -hmm. vision and probably half of them don't have a clear articulable vision for three and five years, I suspect. But tell me about you. What's your biggest headache? What's when what do you just love doing besides talking to entrepreneurs? <laughs> well, I mean, our vision is to help a thousand entrepreneurs own their building. That's our space in the next five years. That's really the, the vision because we feel like our, our vision is bigger than what we do day to day. You talked about early on this conversation about like, I, I'll paraphrase, but helping yeah. business owners, helping entrepreneurs win. That's really what, that's my DNA. Cause I feel like Ben, that we as business owners, entrepreneurs are the drivers of the world, right? I mean, government just spends money that we create, right? We drive the, the economy and we give opportunity to people. We're in the that. community. Yeah. We're yeah. impacting, right? I mean, through the, our employees, through our influence, through you know our customers and clients and all that. And so we really have an opportunity to make a difference and make an impact. And I feel like our vision is we're trying to create an ownership mentality. If you own a business, let's own the real estate. Let's own the market. And because I think entrepreneurs have great values by and large, have, you know, people say, well, they just greedy. They want to get rich. No, it's way beyond that, right? We can't get rich until we You're serve and help a lot of people. Aligned. Right. <laughs> it, and uh, I have a t-shirt that says life is about engaging in win relationships. Like if we do a deal, you have to feel you won. I have to feel I've won. And we've created value for the world. And there's no shame in that. In fact, people should like be paying attention to what you're saying. Because if we would just like start, now I'm on my rant. But if we would teach this stuff in high school and college, <laughs> right? And teach people that you need to be productive. And there's lots of ways to be productive. And lots of ways. It's not like zero sum game, right? One and one is 10. No, so 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 that's awesome. Talk to me a little bit about is Vantage Point. You alluded to this earlier, but is your work Virginia region? You said you've got investors, mm -hmm. so you have a pool of people that have mm -hmm. money, people or organizations that have money that are looking yeah. to participate in real in commercial real estate deals. That's interesting, a, a whole other topic. But where is your work yeah. yourself? limited to Virginia businesses or, or are you beyond? No. Yeah, no, we're national. We, yeah, we can serve people anywhere nationally and we do, and, and we love to do it. And again, not only, you know, our, our main focus and drive is the owner user space, but, but we do a lot of other investment commercial property outside of that, because again, you have a business owner who, or a professional who's making a lot of money they're spinning off cash. They want to invest and, you know, you can put it in wall street or whatever. And some people do, but a lot of people want to put it in real estate for, you know, a, a various long list of reasons, right? You know, diversification, you can touch it, feel it. It's tangible. There's limited amounts of it. There's tax advantages. And so we help a lot of these, our clients, you know, buy investment properties of different types, single family, multifamily storage space is really big right now. A lot of people are doing that. So we do that in it and we do it nationally. And, and so, so yes, we have private investors. We, our funding sources are very diverse from private investors to venture capital, to insurance companies, to actual banks, a lot of non-bank lenders, things like that. So it's a pool of money that can be deployed based upon the circumstances and the situation in particular. Who do you um, like to read, follow, consider maybe a mentor as you continue on your own personal entrepreneurial journey? So I think one of, from a marketing standpoint and a, in a, an entrepreneurial and just a head, getting your head straight perspective, Dan Kennedy, yeah. which I know you're a big involved and advocate there. You're a little famous there, by the way. <laughs> I didn't say it, but I'm familiar with that. I've read all his books. And so, so don't know a lot about you from that. 
I love Dan because he is just no nonsense, just, you know, bottom line, here's how it is. And that's helpful for me because, you know, there's a lot of fluff out there, right? It's like, all right, let's get down to bottom line brass tacks. So I really like him. And of course, you know, I go back to the old principles. I'm a very faithful guy. So I, the Bible's a lot of principles in there that I try to follow. And there's a couple of a couple of really good business oriented well, pastors cool. yeah. and so forth that I follow yeah. that I'm impressed. Yeah. By. So, so yeah. I'm co-authoring with Dan. It's coming out in August, the uh, newest edition of no BS time management for entrepreneurs. So, so wait for it. That'll be good. That's your own book, unleash your business. <laughs> so it, it, that is of course a strategy that we teach, learn from Dan, write books. I've written a bunch of them. Yes. What was your, I'm curious and yeah. others would be curious. And what was your process for getting that done? So I knew I needed a way to get the message out. I did, to your point, wanted to create some differentiation and show up differently. And so I, I thought, well, nobody's talking about this, you know, and everybody I talk to that's had an experience like with a bank or whatever, it's always kind of, they're dropped in. They don't know what they're going through. It's a very stressful experience and generally doesn't work out very well, even though it ultimately, you know, they might get it done. And so I thought that's not our process. So we need to codify it, get it out there, let people know this is what we do. So the process was literally I would take, I took an hour a morning, three hour, three mornings a week. And, and I said, okay, I'm just going to rope this off. And it took me a, really only about 90 days to do it, to do the writing. And I started with an outline and I worked with a writing coach and he helped me kind of, you know, sharpen the pencil a little bit. They did some editing, came back and, you know, back and forth. So it took about six months to get everything done, the formatting, but it really, once I, I committed to the plan and the outline and thought, okay, what would I want to know if I was on the other side of the table and how can I add value? And then I just chunked it down and said, okay, we'll take this chapter and what are the key points? And then broke it down and just attacked it like that. But it was disciplined into like the hour a day for three days a week. I knew I couldn't do five or six. I was like, there's no way. I'm, it's, it's the way I work out. I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to try to work out every day. And then if I end up with four or five, then I'm good. Right. Um, but to say I'm going to go every day and then I don't, then I feel like a loser. So I was like, I'm going to write three days a well, week. And that was very disciplined of you. And I and I know that it will be value. Again, the book is Unleash Your Business. You held it up there a second ago. We'll include link in the show oh. notes. Paul, if people, and then after we go off, I have something I want to talk to you about. But if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way? Best way is the website. It's ownyourbuildingnow.com. <laughs> ownyourbuildingnow.com, right? And you can check, and I'm giving it away, right? I learned this from you and Dan, right? I'm giving the book away, printed, mailed to you. You just pay, I think, $6.95 for shipping and printing and all that. We get it to you. I also have a podcast. It's called The Brick and Mortar Money Show. You can check that out too. We talk a lot about that. But yeah, but through there, you get the book. You can schedule That's an appointment. Wonderful. Paul, it's been great sharing almost an hour or so with you. We love talking to entrepreneurs and a lot of folks, a lot of the things that Paul and I have talked about are just so applicable to even running our own businesses, getting our unique message out there. And I think what Paul has really demonstrated is, you know, he developed this niche interest that he's really good at and then figured out some messaging about that to separate himself from the pack. Of course, now has written the book, Unleash Your Business, has his own podcast and is has got folks that reach out on his behalf to get on podcasts like mine. And it's been really good to have you here um, and chat with you today. Yeah, Ben, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I don't know that your listeners know, but I did reference Dan Kennedy and you are sort of, you're definitely fam famous in the Dan yeah, they know. <laughs> yeah, and, and Dan has spoken for us before okay. and, and he and I are, are remain uh, good friends. And you know, earlier this in the spring, you said you want to co-author the book. And so we, it's a revision, right? Cause it's the thing is the third edition. And I'm like, yeah, Dan, like, Good. And how long? Because I'm really busy. He goes like eight days. <laughs> so we had one phone call and then I worked very hard to get to get my chapters uh, done. So no BS yeah. time management, like have a deadline and make it short. All right, Paul. Yeah, it was great right? to have you today. Hang on for a moment. I want to chat with you about something. Okay. Thanks for being on the program. You bet. Thanks, Ben. If you like what you just heard on the Renegade Lawyer podcast, you may be a perfect fit for the great legal marketing community. 
Law firm owners across the country are becoming heroes to their families and icons in their communities. They've gone renegade by rejecting the status quo of the legal profession so they can deliver high-quality legal services coupled with top-notch customer service to clients who pay, stay, and refer. Learn more at greatlegalmarketing.com. That's greatlegalmarketing.com.